Well, good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here and grateful to be uh, bringing our word this morning. Uh, we're continuing in our series called Why Church? Why Church? Has anybody ever asked that question before? Um, so I'm like, wait, is that a trick question? Am I allowed to raise my hand? Why, why, why do we do this thing called the church? Why is the church significant and relevant, important to us? Why do I even bother my time this morning to be a part of a church community? And specifically this morning, um, we're in this subsection. Pastor Gail uh, kind of uh, launched this uh, sub uh, series within our larger Y Church series on the people. And so we'll be taking uh, three weeks on people, and then we have three weeks on the structure of the church, and then we will end our series three weeks talking about vision of the church. So people, structure, and vision. And I will be parking on uh, this subsection of people, and most specifically, what does it mean for us to be the people of God. Why is it important for us to be the community of faith and to be the church? Uh, before I uh, read our scripture passage this morning, I, um, I wanna uh, dovetail a little bit off of what Pastor Katie shared in their announcements around the invitation around healing circles. Um, you know, when our pastors and our preaching team last year, at the end of last year, we were praying and thinking about, okay, what, what, how do we want to begin this year off uh, on a sermon series? What are the things that we want to preach on and teach on and wrestle with and, and discuss together as a community, as Quest? Um, you know, this, the, when the question even came up, should we do a, a series on why the church, full confession, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. Um, it's too, it's too personal. It's too, uh, it's too vulnerable. Um, even as a pastor, as a church leader to ask the question, why is what you do significant and in, in matter in the work that you do and what you believe in? Um, it's complex. And when we were beginning the planning and praying over the series, it brought up a lot of feels. It brought a, up a lot of heaviness uh, to address this matter for our people right now. And these are the conversations, if we're honest, these are the conversations, if we're faithful to this work, these are the conversations that we would have constantly with you all, constantly on our pastoral care meetings. For those who ask, why is the church even important? Why? I don't know if I still believe in or have any hope in the church. I believe in God and I have spirit. I believe in the spirit, but I don't know if I still really believe in the church. What is this all for? And I believe that, you know, the pandemic jump-started these existential questions for us. What is this all for? What is the meaning of life? Why do I choose to wear pants with zippers and buttons on them when I can just wear sweatpants all day? The real important questions, life. And why church? Why does it even matter? And I think that it's important for us to respond to the needs of where we feel like the people are at and where the church is at. And as a reflection on our part as well, why we believe in this work. And as I focus uh, our attention this morning specifically on people and on community underneath that question of why church, I want to begin by acknowledging the pain and the hurt and the trauma that many folks, many folks here sitting in this room, many folks who are watching this online, specifically those who have experienced deep, deep pain and wounds from the church, have experienced it from and by the people, by individuals, by church leaders, by pastors, and I simply want to offer a word for us as we begin this morning is, I'm sorry. As the church, on behalf of the church, on behalf of leaders, on behalf of pastors in the church, to simply ask for your forgiveness 
for the hurt and the suffering and the pain that has been caused by the church. And so I validate where you're at. I hold that tenderness and that space, and I see you in that burden that you carry. And so I just want to echo that invitation from Pastor, K- from Pastor Katie uh, this morning, that the, the invitation in partnership with Unity Collective, these circles of healing for those who have experienced spiritual or church trauma, we want to invite you to be a part of that conversation. And I pray that that would be a space of both healing um, and that would help in your journey. Amen. Amen. Our text this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, um, starting in verse 1. And we'll be reading the, the, the chapter in its entirety. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them. And uh, we'll have our text on the screen as well. And so Paul writes these words in Romans 12, starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, siblings, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. Turn to someone and say, we belong to each other. Like you mean it. We belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to serve on the AVL team, then serve on the AVL team. (laughs) That was for you, Elton. That was for you. If it is teaching, then to teach. If it is to giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, I want to preach from the subject, the beloved movement. The beloved movement. Um... You know, the last couple of uh, months, we, we were in the Exodus, the book of Exodus. Uh, we started 
uh, the fall season on our series on the Holy Spirit, journeying through uh, the lens of looking through the story of the Exodus story, the Israelite story of both redemption and wandering in the wilderness on their journey to the promised land. And as we came into this new year, we continued um, uh, looking through the Exodus text, and I'm taking a little bit of a break there, and throughout our series, our preachers will be looking at different texts as we look at uh, our Why Church series. But we've been in this Exodus story and, 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 and learning and sitting with this story for such a long time that even as I'm preaching from Romans, I have a little bit of the Israel story still uh, in me. It still hasn't left. It has been in my meditation. It's been something that I've been thinking and praying and processing through as we even look at the Why Church and what it means to be the people of God and in Community, Because I believe that when you look carefully, you see some parallels and themes that repeat itself. That if you look at the Exodus story, and particularly from the lens of what does it mean for the people of God to be the people of God, you see a lot of parallels with the early church as well, too. That as the early Christians and followers of Jesus post the resurrection began to follow the Spirit, and after Jesus was ascended and and breathed on the disciples, now received the Holy Spirit, now go and spread the good news, the gospel, to all people in Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, as Jesus is giving that instruction to the early church, and the birth of the church began to, to move and grow and expand, they were also trying to figure out what it means to be a community. The people of God, trying to figure out what in the world does it mean and look like to be the people of God. Of course, I could tell you this morning that community is vital to the life of following Jesus and that the church is a significant part of that journey. I could try to convince you that it's important for those who consider themselves Christians that to be part of the church community is important and that wouldn't be altogether untrue. Because I do believe in the value and the importance of belonging to a church to actively be in community as you pursue what it means to love God and to love neighbor. But also, in addition to that, I also believe that it's not that I am here trying to convince you that you need the church. I want to tell you and remind you that the church needs you. That as Pastor Gail preached last week, the, the image of the biodiverse farm and this, this ecosystem of this beautiful picture of the farm, that all of it works together in order for it to thrive. There is nothing wasted on this biodiverse farm. And it's a beautiful picture because I think oftentimes we can come into spaces, particularly the church, sit and gather here, and maybe this question may emerge in your head. Why am I even important into this space? Am I even significant to, quote, unquote, to, to quest a church and thriving of a church? Does the church really need me? You know, when I think about Romans 12, it's often subtitled the life of the believer or life in the spirit. Or in my uh, Bible, it says marks of a true Christian as they subtitle to it. However you want to frame it, Romans 12 is, is, is Paul's kind of uh, picture of what does it look like for us to actually be in community. It's a little uh, a picture of, of Paul saying this is what a life of community and being the people of God ought to look like. In the Greek, that first phrase there in verse 9, let love be genuine, is really interesting because there's actually no verb there. It would actually uh, just translate simply as the love genuine or the love sincere or the love authentic. And what he's basically saying is if you want a picture of what sincere love looks like, continue reading on. Keep reading to see what authentic and sincere love looks like in community and so what then follows afterwards is that nine times Paul says this phrase, one another or with or with everyone in just these 10 verses. Nine times Paul says either one another, with or everyone in just these 10 verses. Love one another. 
give sacrificially to one another. There, there, there's this thought that we can do without the church or the community of faith that I can just follow Jesus on my own. It's just me and Jesus, we just besties and I'm deuces with the church. I don't need the church or the community. Then I would say this lovingly as a pastor, how do you do anything with one another if there's not another person to do it? How do you extend hospitality to one another if you're not in community with other people? How do you show generosity to other people if you are not in community? And then on the flip side, how do you receive love from another if I'm not in community? How do I receive hospitality? How do I do this relationship one another with everybody, with other people that I am committed to and in relationship and in community with, without others? There's this quote by Grace Lee Boggs, Chinese-American social activist, feminist, community organizer, and author. I love the work and legacy that Grace Lee Boggs um, has put out into the world. And she says this quote that I love, building community is to the collective as spiritual practices are to the individual. I'll say that again. Building community is to the collective as spiritual practices are to the individual. You know, I, I love that comparison in parallel. She's saying that just as all of your uh, individual uh, 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 faith practices and spiritual disciplines, whether it's prayer or worship or meditating on scripture or being in silence and solitude, connecting with God in nature, resting in Sabbath, whatever it may be that deepens and enriches your individual spiritual life in the same way, in the same way that being part of building and co-creating community, a.k.a. the church, is the spiritual practice that deepens, enriches the collective's spiritual life as well. You know, we have this uh, a statement of belonging and this mantra here at Quest. As you come into these walls, any of these lobbies, you cannot get past, you can't get into this sanctuary without seeing these words that everyone belongs. Amen? Everyone belongs. Everyone belongs. It's a statement. It's a conviction. It's a value-based truth that we declare that regardless of your race, ethnicity, gender, whom you choose to love, where you came from, how you were raised, or your background, you are welcome here. And you belong here. This place called Quest Church is made for you. Is made for you. That's what everyone belongs means. Now, we don't have it on these words on the wall here, but if I would go one step deeper, and if I said everyone matters, though, everybody matters in this place, that would say something different. You matter. You are needed. You are wanted. Everything about you, your voice, your gifts, your perspectives, your view of life and, your, and God, your time, talent, and treasure, your creativity, your offering, you are necessary here, and you add value here. This place called Quest Church is made of you is made of you and so it's a both and to be a part of the church one part of it says that gosh this is the place that i belong but this is also the place that i matter my offerings what i bring to the table matters do you remember uh potlucks remember those <laughs> Since the pandemic, we're like, oh, no, no, we don't do those anymore. Don't do those anymore. But remember, remember, the, remember, use your imagination two years ago. Potlucks, church potlucks, community potlucks, your office potlucks, team, team, team dinners and potlucks, right? Um, I, I love, I love a good potluck. I miss the church potluck days. I remember distinctly, like right before the pandemic, though, we had, um, um, we held a potluck in the back of the sanctuary, and it was a little bit different and significant where we said, hey, we're having a, a church-wide potluck right after church, and what we're inviting you to is to bring a dish that speaks, that tells your story, that's significant to who you are, that, 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 that speaks of home to you, that when you bring it, you can offer to uh, the conversation the significance of that dish uh, who made it? What, what, how old were you when you first had it? Why is it meaningful to you and to your story? And we had it in the back, and it was just like, it was a, it was a beautiful, a beautiful time of, of potlucking, if you can. Um, and it, it, 
Each dish had a story and a different flavor and taste. It was a lived experience, a tradition, a memory that was attached to that dish. There was soul, there was heart, there was joy, there was honoring the past. There was a keeping of a legacy of ancestors. And then in a potluck, to say that everyone belongs is to say that everyone gets to eat. Everyone has a seat at the table. Everyone gets to be fed. Everyone can grab a plate and start piling it on. Let everything just mix and touch each other, you know? But also in a potluck, to say that everybody matters, everyone's needed and necessary, means that everyone's dish, everyone's entree, everyone's offering is necessary for this potluck to be a potluck. Everyone's contribution is significant. Everyone's offering to the communal table adds value. Do you know what you call a potluck when two people bring food and cook for 10 people? A not luck. Brandy, Brandy, I see you cringing right now, but that was for you. That took me about 10 minutes to write that one. But no, sir, what do you call it when just two people bring food for, for, for 10 people? That's, just a re- that's a restaurant. Do you know what I'm saying? Because a potluck is what's required and necessary. It's part of the thing that we love so much about is that we get to partake in it. Is also, there's, a, there's an understanding that you also offer something. You also bring something to the table. And not that everybody brings the same thing. You don't want everyone bringing a main dish. You don't want everyone bringing meats and proteins. You don't want everyone bringing the carbs. You don't want everyone bringing a kale dish. One is more than enough. You don't want everyone bringing desserts. You need a good spread. You need diversity in contribution. There might be times where you're like, I'm in a season right now where I can't make a main dish. I'll bring the drinks. That's needed. That's necessary. I've been to potlucks where we're like, this looks amazing. Who brought beverages, though? <laughs> Everything is needed. Your very being, your existence, everything that makes you who you are, how you are, how you are wired, impacts, changes the ecosystem. It changes this place. You know, I just, you know, I, I sit in the back. I, I, I don't really mad. I don't participate. I'm not really involved. And my presence isn't really that significant. No, it matters. Let me, let me, let me, let me shift the analogy because food is more of like my language. But like, we sing when we start our services. We sing our songs and we worship together as a community. Do you know, and I can't tell you the why behind it, but do you know that when the team is rehearsing and there's actually nobody here in this space, it's sa- there's a different sound. That when the worship team practices and rehearses, there's a different sound and the acoustics of where, where, where sound travels and it bounces off the walls and it bounces off people's bodies. Do you know that you may not be able to, I may not be able to tell the difference, but there is an actual difference if there was 10 people here, if there was 50 people here, if there was 100, if there was 200 people here, there's a different sound that actually would happen in this place. Something changes. So actually, your body here in this place you being here while we sing, and then you walked out of the place, there is actually a different sound that takes place. And that is what a picture of community looks like, is that when, you, when we are here gathered in this place, your presence, your body, you matter in this place. The community has a sound. What is the, our sound here at Quest? What do we sound like? Well, I pray and hope that our church would sound like love and grace and kindness and mercy and justice and reconciliation and compassion and forgiveness. That is the hope that I would pray and believe that our church sounds like. When I think about the story of Israel journeying through the wilderness, I could see and I could imagine that they were really frustrated because they were probably thinking when they crossed the Red Sea and the promise that Yahweh said to them, I, I have a place prepared for you that flows uh, with milk and honey. 
this place that is the promised land. I have that for you. They didn't know at that time that it was going to take them 40 years. There was frustration, I'm sure, of, uh, are, we, are we almost there, Moses? Like, where, where, are we going to get there yet? What's taking so Is God lost? Does he know where we're supposed to go? Because you hear um, uh, uh, scholars that have the map of where, where they cross the Red Sea to the place of the can- uh, to, to land of Canaan is, is, is actually, uh, it's, it's not that far of a distance. They could have gotten there if they went in a direct straight line, but it took them 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. And sometimes they say things like this. It was a, a lack of obedience to God. And I've heard that preached before. Oh, if they just obeyed, if they just followed, they would have gotten there quicker. And there's no real evidence that that is true. And I think that the more I've been meditating on this story, because I just want to get to where we need to get to. I'm a destination type of person. I know how to get to certain places, and I will still GPS where I need to go because I was be like, listen, I want to get there as fast as possible. Send me Waze or Google Maps. I want the most direct route possible. Anybody else like that too? I don't want to waste no time. I don't want to waste some time. And the more I sit with this story, and the more I even sit with the early church too, is that destinations and mountaintop moments and the rival moments, if, we're, if I'm really honest, and I hate to break it to you all, those are few and far between in real life. They happen and we experience them, and we are celebratory. We, 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 we celebrate that season of joy and mountaintop moments, arrival and destination moments, but the majority of life is sitting in traffic. The majority of life is in that waiting space. The majority of life is in between where I just left and where I'm going right now. So much of life happens there. And the thing about it is, is that, is that there, the Israelite story is, is, is people trying to become a community. It didn't happen once they got to Canaan. It didn't happen once they got to the promised land. They didn't become a community once they stopped on their journey or once they reached their destination or once they found their place of grounding and footing and rootedness. They figured out what it meant to be community, what it meant to be the people of God on the go, moving and figuring it out, and uncertain at times, and terrified, and with doubts, and yeah, throw in a little bit of disobedience in there too. Yeah, throw in a little bit of, let's make a golden calf. That sounds like a good idea. Let's throw a couple of those things in there as well. But the majority of their figuring it out of what it means to be a people, what it means to be community, happen in the in-between. And guess what? It keeps happening today. Some of us are here this morning and we're like, I'm just in between spaces of life right now. I'm in between. I don't know how long I'm going to be here in Seattle. I don't even know what, I don't even know if I, if I like this church or not. I don't even know if I'm, I'm in so much, I have doubts. I carry a lot of things with me too. And you are in between spaces. And I just want to say to you, You're exactly where you're supposed to be. We are exactly where we're supposed to be, especially in this conversation around what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be a community? Because God exists in the in-between spaces of our lives. The kingdom of God, as much as it sounds like an established fixed reality, is more like an evolving, growing reality that ebbs and flows and points us to where God is going and moving. A kingdom of peace and justice and righteousness and belonging is already here, but also not yet. God breathes, God moves and meets us in the uncertain spaces, in the shadows of doubt and despair. God shows up in the wilderness and wandering, wrestling spaces of our life, the places that feel so unrooted and liminal and in between, that's exactly where God finds us. And that's exactly where God makes and forms God's people and shapes a community. Just this past week, um, it was a really hard uh, past few weeks. Um, in just this past week, just in our in in, in pa- some pastoral care spaces, um, I, I I helped a quester. A group of us helped 
um, uh, a longtime quester move some furniture into his new place. Um, uh, it's actually his old place, but it, it burnt down. Um, uh, half of it burnt about a year and a half ago. And to help him move uh, to a place that's both familiar and also very foreign, um, but to sit there, as painful as that journey was, to rejoice with him. Rejoice this moment in space. Um, prayed and got a, was, got a text from one of our questers that we've been journeying with for um, over six months now to just get this text over the weekend to say, thank you for all your prayers. I finally landed this job. Finally landing this job. Got an offer letter. And in the same week, praying for people who are looking for work, who have been laid off at the end of the year, and journeying with people, rejoicing with people, and also grieving and mourning with people. Being at the hospital to say goodbye to loved ones and partners this past week. Mourning and grieving with those who are grieving. And then to hear about the tragic shootings in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay over Lunar, Lunar New Year week. Uh, and the grief of our API community and uh, a beloved person in our community, um, Hansu Kim, the owner of Rainier Teriyaki, lost his life in a tragedy. To grieve the life and the injustice against black bodies of Keenan Anderson, of Tyree Nichols, of holding space for the trauma of our black siblings. And when I think about Romans 12, to simply say rejoice with those who rejoice and to grieve with those who grieve, what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean to hold space that we see one another in our joys and the things that we celebrate, but at the same time we grieve and we mourn with those who mourn? You know, when I listen to people who are wrestling with why does the church even matter? This is why. This is why. The church and the community still matters today. Listen, I'm not saying that the church is perfect. Far from it. But my belief in the church still to this day is because we can't do this stuff alone. We can't do this work. We can't, we can't, we can't live in this America alone. I come from a tradition in the Korean church and time spent in the black church where the church was the place where we'd go for refuge, for, to grieve, to pray, to lament, and to simply be with the community. And if we can't do that here, then I would say we're absolutely right that the church is irrelevant. But if we step into that call of what Romans 12 actually calls us to do, then the church still matters today. The community of faith still matters today to say that I see you. I see you in your pain. I see you in the injustice and I'm with you, and I pray with you and for you, that things would change for sure, that systemic things would change for sure, but to simply say, I'm praying that you'd get through today, that you would get through this week, and that we can do that and be that for each other. And it's one thing for me to say that and to say it from a pulpit, but it's another thing that we embody, and I just felt that the Spirit was inviting me this morning specifically, is that we would actually put that into practice today. And so I've asked Pastor Matt and worship team to come, and as we head into communion, just to create a space as a community to pray, to simply be to simply grieve and to lament, to see one another and to hold each other in a space where we can actually practice what it means to be a community, to be the people of God, to be a church. 
And so before Pastor Gail comes to lead us in communion, I just want to create some space this morning. That wherever you find yourself today, however you enter, whatever burden that you are carrying today, whatever grief or doubt or uncertainty, I want to speak um, this truth over you that you are loved, that God sees you, that God is with us, and that as we as a community can be praying and believing and confessing that that is true for the person that is sitting next to you, person that's sitting around you, that we can hold one another in that space. And so just for a few minutes, I want to invite us just to pray, just to be together and share space, share sacred ground together and hold each other in that. I've asked a few of our staff and a few of our prayer team members to just be available on the sides. If you would like prayer, we would, we would love to just be praying with you and for you as we head into communion. So if we can, just take a few moments. God, I thank you that you are God who is with us and sees us and holds us. God, even in my own conviction that I believe in the church, I believe in the people of God, I believe in the power of community, that in Christ we hold each other, we, we carry each other's burdens, we rejoice together, we forgive one another, we extend hospitality to each other, we share common needs among each other as Paul writes, in Romans 12. But God, in this moment, on this day, God, I just, I want to invite us to just be prayerful and present for each other. And whatever it is that we need, God, from you and from this space, I pray that our hearts would feel a little lighter, a little bit more comforted, knowing that we don't journey alone, that we see each other and we hold each other in the suffering, in the injustices, and that, God, that you are with us and you continue to breathe life and hope and possibility, even in the in-between spaces, God.